Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 36 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. We are live from my girlfriend's basement. Are we? I, I guess we're not live. We're recording this. I don't know. Podcasts are weird. Like, we are live. Right. Like, this is live right now for us, but... In fact, we're in the same place. This is in true. We are in the same place. After 36 episodes, <laughs> Gavin and I are recording in the exact same place. I can see his face. I can touch his wonderful, wonderful beard. Oh, thank you. Oh, I didn't even finish the rest of the intro. This is episode 36 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast <laughs> about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. Gavin, how you doing? I'm good, buddy. Uh, I am moving to California. Uh, actually, by the time uh, you are listening to this, the day this goes <laughs> yeah, out... Yeah, where are you going to be? When, let me uh, actually look, because I have it all planned uh, out. Um, so I will be somewhere between, uh, let's see, Wednesday, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. All right. Somewhere on, I believe that's I-40? I don't know. Somewhere driving, probably Texas, because even though I drive through just a little sliver of Texas, Texas takes forever. <laughs> so Something about that state will just keep you there forever. Yeah. And so Gavin is going to be a, uh, a West Coaster. I don't want to like say permanently, because permanently is one hell of a word. But like for the foreseeable future, Gavin is going to be out in California on the West Coast. And this is going to be really the last time I get to see you for quite a while. Yeah, and like obviously, I'm very excited to be um, getting an apartment with my uh, mm -hmm. with my girlfriend, starting a wonderful new job in my field, which is really important. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it does definitely makes me sad uh, not being able to see all my East Coast friends probably as much as I would like. But and I'm sure I'm sure many more West Coast friends will be made. But we still have one more episode to record, and so um, in spirit of that, we're, are we doing a calendar today? No, I didn't even bring it. All right. I, honestly, <laughs> I'm totally okay with that. And to be honest, you'll hear my girlfriend's dog barking in the background. She does not like strangers in the house. So, you know. That's why we're in the basement. Yep. You can enjoy that. Um, and to to kind of celebrate this being sort of the end of an era, we're not ending the podcast. Are we ending the podcast? No, of course not. Okay. We had not had a conversation about that, so I wanted to make sure. <laughs> Um, but this sort of being the end of an era, Gavin kind of recommended us to do a uh, kind of a fun episode today. So, Gavin, what, what are we going to be discussing today? So, since we've been doing a little bit of uh, media criticism as of late. <laughs> we. Well, yeah. Uh, the podcast has been. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, podcast trademark. Yes. So, we decided to uh, watch. Actually, I should thank my niece for this uh, because she has been very into the Disney movie Dinosaur mm -hmm. from 2000. Uh, she loves dinosaurs, which I love. Um, in fact, like if you ask her, what's a dinosaur say? She'll be like, ah. <laughs> and how old is this niece? She is two. Two years old. And so mm -hmm. she's been very into this movie on Disney that is available on Disney Plus. It absolutely is. So which I is how highly, I found it. I highly recommend, if you have not seen it, check it out. It, it is a very wholesome movie. Um and it's, even though it's 21 years old at this point, I think the graphics still kind of held up to, so, to a bit. So I want to, we're going to get into that in a second, but to begin this. So I started watching this and then my girlfriend came home yesterday and she saw me watching this and, she looked, <laughs> and then she looked at the TV and we both had the same, same reaction. Are you, are you familiar with the Mandela effect? Yes. So the Mandela effect, you know, with like collective false memories. So yeah. everybody thinks the Monopoly guy has a monocle on when he doesn't actually have a monocle. The, yeah, there's the, the most famous one that I'm aware of, besides obviously the, how it's named. Yeah, is the Baron Steen. Bears. Exactly. How everyone thinks that it's Baron Steen, S T E I N, but it's actually Baron Stain with an A. With an A. Yes. Which blew my mind, and like every single person that I've ever asked has been like, "Oh, it's obviously Baron Steen," mm -hmm. but no, if you actually look. It is Baron Stain all the way back to when it right. first started. And it always has been, even yeah. though people, like people, you know, really like, like they remember, they distinctly remember Baron Steen bears, even though it never actually happened. And so the reason I bring that up is because like, we both might be wrong on this, but both me and my girlfriend immediately, as soon as we put it on, we're like, we have both seen this movie before. This is not the first time that we have seen this movie about dinosaurs. As soon as I was on, I was like, 
we had this DVD growing up. It was it was very, very popular when it came out. It didn't have that good of a theatrical release, but it was one of the first movies ever put onto DVDs. Oh, was it really? Especially Disney movies. Okay. Uh, so that's a little bit of history that I learned about this movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was one of the first movies ever put out on DVD. And therefore broke sort of record sales numbers because it was, you know... It was one of the first, right. right. It was a new um, thing, a new thing. And uh, Disney also publicized the heck out of it because obviously every child loves dinosaurs. Uh, and also, uh, I have a little bit of a personal connection with this movie because... Oh. So I went to Disney World. I don't remember anything else about the trip, if I'm being honest. But I was probably... So if this came out in 2000, uh, it was probably 2000 or 2001. So I was like four or five. The only thing I remember to that trip was going on this ride and it's scaring the absolute bejesus out of me. <laughs> like, I cried the entire time. Wait, what ride was this? Th- there is a dinosaur ride at Disney. Oh my god, I might be remembering this. Oh my, wait, wh- how old were you when you went? Um, I, I might be misremembering the year, but I was very young. I, because I went to Disney World when I was like four and seven. It, it, I don't think I, it would have been, actually, mm, I mean, no, I was born in 95. What year did this movie come out? 2000. So it would not have been there if you went when you were born. But when I was seven, right. I think I remember going on a ride with, like, animatronic, like, dinosaur things. Yeah, so that was, My pro- God. So that was probably this ride. So the ride is different than the movie, obviously. Um, but with featuring many of the same characters. So, speaking of the characters, let's do uh, a little synopsis that I cooked up. Uh, and the whole point of this movie kind of boils down to it's basically the land before time but with better graphics uh, <laughs> <laughs> better better is an interesting word Ooh, that might be a hot take but we'll talk about a little it. bit of a hot take so we start with a dinosaur egg whose herd gets attacked by a carnotaurus and i will go into all of the dinosaurs and animals in the movie uh in a little bit but big theropod dinosaur a la t-rex velociraptor and such but quite large Uh, Through a series of several animals trying and failing to eat the egg, the egg ends up on an island with no dinosaurs on it. This is like a Scooby-Doo thing, where, like, the egg egg is, like, falling, and, like, it gets eaten by one animal and spit up and goes down the river. It was was kind of one of those things, like, all right, Mm -hmm. we we see where this is going, and yet, fine, it's a cool sequence to begin. Uh, A group of lemurs find the egg and decide to raise the dinosaur that hatches while they are talking about whether or not to keep the egg. (laughs) Uh, we cut to several years in the future when the dinosaur, an iguanodon named Aladar, is all grown up. Iguanodons are very similar to what most people think of, like your duck-billed dinosaurs. Um, not quite in that same group, but very closely related. Uh, so, you know, walks on four legs, eats plants, quite large. During a courtship ceremony between the lemurs, a giant asteroid hits the ocean off the coast of the island, and Aladar escapes the island with only four lemurs out of the several dozen that we see. Uh, and the lemurs are named Yar, his son Zinni, his daughter Pleo, and Pleo's daughter Suri. So out of all of the lemurs, only four survive. After walking through a desert hellscape and being chased by some much too large velociraptors, <laughs> the group finds a herd of mixed dinosaurs led by another large male iguanodon named Crone. At the tail end of the herd, we have an elderly female Styracosaurus named Ema. Styracosaurus is... A ceratopsian, similar to uh, Triceratops. Uh, an elderly female Brachiosaurus named Baleen. Uh, Brachiosaurus is one of the larger sauropod dinosaurs that we have talked about on the podcast before. Mm-hmm. The largest dinosaurs ever. And their pet? Somehow? I don't... That's something I want to talk about. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Uoplocephalus is the name of that dinosaur. It is an ankylosaur, sort of like the armored uh, club tail dinosaurs. Named Earl. After the elderly dinosaurs complain that the herd moves too quickly and that they're going to be left behind, Aladar tries to talk to Crone to get him to slow the herd down. And to, just to be clear, at this point, so like Aladar is portrayed as like you know, like the knight, like he's you know, he's the guy looking out for everybody else, mm-hmm. talking to you know the big dinosaur. After the asteroid is hit and like the Earth is a total hellscape, yes. like it's like like I. I'm not sure what waiting around would have done for uh, for these older dinosaurs. He's just trying to be nice. He's very, at this point, kind of naive, I think is a good word for it. Naive or idealistic. Yeah. Or, yeah, there, right. There's a couple of words that you could go with here. Like, he is definitely, the movie's trying to portray him as the good guy. Yes, very much. 
and I'm not I'm not sure I buy it. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Crone is a jerk about it, calls Aladar an idiot, and basically says that the weak die, tough luck. Uh, we find out that he conveniently has a hot younger sister named Nira, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Crone continues to march to the herd too fast, but with the promise of water at the end of this leg of the trip. We also get shown that two Carnotaurus are following the herd, those big meat-eating dinosaurs. So can we really quick pause here? Yeah. This is part of what I'm talking about, where... You know, Aladar is saying, you know, we need to, you know, watch out for the, like, the, you know, the older and weaker dinosaurs. Uh -huh. And Crone, this like, you know, crusty old, like, you know, the antagonist for most of the movie. Right. Um, or one of the antagonists for most of the movie. By the way, uh, you know, 10 minutes into this podcast. Spoiler alert for the entire movie, <laughs> Dinosaur. Um, probably should have said. Yeah, we probably should have led with that. Well, you know, I'll put it in the title. So you, oh. you already know, spoiler <laughs> alert, but... Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about the movie Dinosaur. Uh, so they are in a stretch where there is no water. Right. Where staying in one place does not help anybody. So while I get the whole, we need to like look out for the weak and everything. If they didn't move fast, the weaker dinosaurs were going to die anyways because there was no water. I, I think that's a fair defense for the water argument. Right. For the predator argument, I don't think that's a good defense because what's the point of a herd? That, okay, so that's fair. So there's there's two sort of enemies that the group is facing at this point. One is predators, right? Which there is there are enough dinosaurs in this herd to fend off, as you will see much later in the movie. Yeah, really anything that can come. But there's no water, like right. And at one point they tell everybody, like there is no water for the next however long. You need to you need to get your way there. Yeah, like and if you can't make it, there is nothing that can be done. So I am. Pro Chrome for <laughs> for this section of the film because I think that's the best choice you have. I'm not sure what other options we, are available. We can dissect that a little later. Okay. Okay. Uh, when the herd gets to where the water is supposed to be, the lake bed is dry. Chrome sends his second in command off to search the perimeter of the now dry lake, but continues to drive the herd forward without even a little bit of rest. Ema is too tired to keep going and wanders into the lake bed, basically whining about how there used to be water here. There was always water here. Mm -hmm. uh, as Aladar, the lemurs, and Baleen follow her, Baleen's massive weight breaks through the dry bed lake a little bit. And Aladar has her pressed down really hard, which reveals some water hidden in the sand. Aladar yells to the herd that he found water, which kind of pisses off Crone. He comes over and steals all the water for himself. As the herd fights over the water, which, keep in mind, is only, like, the footprint of, granted, a very large dinosaur, so, like, Maybe a large dinner plate, at most like a two foot circle, probably something like that. Yeah, you know a you know a pretty good sized hole in the ground, but for a herd of basically dying dinosaurs, yeah, exactly large, you know, all, nearly elephant sized, most of them right. dinosaurs. Um, uh, so Aladar and the old folks move to a slightly different location and dig up some more water for themselves and for some young dinosaurs who can't fight the adults for water of their own. We cut to Bruton, the person that Crone sent off to find water, being attacked by the pair of Carnotaurus. We then cut back to Nera and Aladar flirting, because of course they do. Bruton survived the attack and runs back to the herd, leading the Carnotaurus to them. The herd moves out and Aladar tries to get them to stay back to help protect the old folks. Crone attacks him and says that he will kill him if he interferes again. As one does. Yeah. Aladar stays back with the old folks, and the herd leaves them behind. That night, while following the herd, the group finds Bruton, who also got left behind because of his wounds from the Carnotaurus attack. As a storm approaches, the group hides out in a cave, and Bruton begrudgingly joins them. Cleo, the lemur, brings him some kind of plant that she finds in the cave that f somehow grew on their island and also somehow heals him a little bit? Yeah, I, th that was... It was, was a plot device. Yeah. Uh... She also has some wise words about hope or something. Later that night, the Carnotaurus find the cave and attack the group, but Bruton saved the group by collapsing the cave, killing one of the two Carnotaurus and himself. We cut to the herd, who are continuing on as baby dinosaurs and other, uh, like adults and stuff, continue to drop and get left behind. Aladar and the old folks keep going deeper into the cave, and at its end find a way out into the nesting grounds that the herd has been heading to. 
There's a tiny hole that's open, but when Aladar tries to move some rocks, it closes. Baleen basically says, I'm getting too old for this stuff. <laughs> and just bulldozes through the wall of collapsed rocks because she's a sauropod and she can do that. It's a good translation. Yeah. The group celebrates that the nesting grounds was spared by the meteor, but it seems that the herd isn't there yet, even though they probably should have been. Ima then sees, because she has been there before in previous you know, migrations, then sees that the normal way of accessing the nesting grounds is blocked by a rock collapse that's a sheer drop on the side, and the herd can't get over. A wildly, almost too perfectly inconvenient rock collapse. Like, I don't know. I, I bought it. Like, as a geologist, I, I kind of bought okay. it. If, it. It was very convenient, I will say. If you uh, as a geologist bought it, then you know what? That's good enough, because you know more than I was like, I don't see that why that couldn't happen. Okay, fair enough. Eladar turns back, or runs back to tell the herd. The herd arrives at the newly found rock wall, and Crone decides, so instead of trying to find a way around like a smart person, that they'll climb it in the morning. <laughs> because, of course. Eladar passes the Carnotaurus on its way to the herd, but when he gets there, he tells the herd that there's another way. But Crone is a bad person and decides to just fight him instead. He also throws sand in Eladar's eyes like a scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> this is where even I was like, all right, like, right. come on, buddy, friend, pal. Uh, when he is about to kill Eladar, Nira steps in and knocks him over. Eladar and Nira start to lead the, way, uh, lead the herd away from the rocks and toward the safer way, when the Carnotaurus, very conveniently, shows up. Through teamwork, and actually acting like a herd, <laughs> the dinosaurs get around the Carnotaurus by standing together, but Crone is still a big, stubborn scumbag. <laughs> I'm, le- I'm reading this, like, directly from uh, a synopsis, or summary, synopsis. Did you write this, or was this already written? No, this was me writing it. Okay, that's, I, um, that's what I thought. So, yeah, I'm reading this directly. I had a lot of fun writing the synopsis. I can tell. Um, yeah, he's still a scumbag, and trying to climb the rocks by himself. The Carnotaurus sees him alone and goes after him. Aladar and Nira rush after them. Crone gets to the top of the cliff, sees a cliff that Aladar definitely told him was going to be there, mm-hmm. and is attacked by the Carnotaurus. Aladar and Nira fight off the Carnotaurus and push it over the cliff, but Crone dies. Oops. That was hurt. a little sad. Eh. <laughs> I wasn't that sad. At that, at that point, even Crone had lost me. Right. The herd gets to the nesting grounds, and we flash forward a bit to see Aladar and Nira's eggs hatching, because of course they had babies. Mm-hmm. The lemurs found new lemurs that lived there, I guess. All the dinosaurs trumpet victoriously as all the eggs of all the different species hatch at the exact same time and movie ends. Scene. Yeah, that all right, so that was that was the movie. Now Now where do you want where do you want to take this from here? So that was that was the movie itself. Yes. We recommend at this point, if you haven't seen the movie, <laughs> give it a watch. It's on Disney Plus. Uh you know, I'm sure just Googling dinosaur might not be helpful, but if you Google dinosaur movie, yes. that you know, you could probably find some other, you know, means of watching it. So, that, assuming that you're familiar with it, and if that synopsis was good enough for you, then it's good enough for us. But where do you want to go from here, Kevin? So, from here, I want to talk about the dinosaurs themselves. Because this was one of the, aside from them being anthropomorphic, obviously, um, a lot of them don't actually talk. Like, there are one, two, three, four, like, less than, like less than ten speaking characters is it really okay or like at least dinosaurs that speak okay because there's several lemurs that say stuff especially at the beginning um but dinosaurs there's like less than 10 and four of them are iguanodons and -hmm. there's even lots of like npc iguanodons that they show throughout the movie (laughs) yes um who just have the dumbest look on their face the whole time the whole time (laughs) and they all look exactly the same like the four iguanodons that speak Look very different from one another. They're like yeah, the animators got to that point, like all right, control C, right. control V, right. But all but move to the left. All the ones that don't speak look exactly the same. They're not even a different color than each other. I correct. Yes. Um, so well, let's talk about the dinosaurs. So first is Iguanodon. Okay. So Iguanodon is uh, an Iguanodontian uh, dinosaur. Basically, it is, it is an ornithopod, so it's in the same group as most of those duck-billed dinosaurs, but. Mm-hmm. Duckbill dinosaurs traditionally are in uh, the family Hadrosauridae, and this is sort of just outside of it. So okay. very similar, but not quite the same. Right. Um, so it is roughly uh, a, somewhere between rhino and elephant size, more toward elephant size in real okay. life. Um, and one of the big defining features of Iguanodon uh, are, A, its teeth, 
as, as the name sort of implies. So anything with Don or Daunt in it means teeth. I want to get to this in a second, but go ahead. Oh, we will talk about their teeth. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm glad you had that written down because that was something I wanted to, I wanted uh, to bring up. So it was named Iguanodon because its teeth are very much like iguanas, uh, at least, you know, in the fossils, not in the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the other really notable things for Iguanodon is uh, that they have a big spike that is in place of their thumb. Mm-hmm. So they do still have bones in there, but it is basically covered in a horn that they use to basically stab stuff with. Uh, and they actually showed that uh, a good couple of times in the movie. Uh, at the sort of sort of the end of the movie, when Aladar and Crone are fighting, Crone sort of backhands him and cuts him across the chest with it. Mm-hmm. And then right when he's about to kill him, when when Nira sort of tackles Crone out of the way, he's sort of winding up to come down across his body with his thumb out, like he's going to like stab him in the face right, right. with his big thumb spike. Uh, and it's really funny. So Iguanodon is one of like the first ever dinosaurs discovered in like the early 1800s and like named properly and everything. Really? Yeah. Okay. Very, very long history of this dinosaur. But the people, obviously, if it's one of the first ones discovered, people had no idea what the hell it was. <laughs> so they put the thumb spike on the end of its nose originally, as makes sense for a spike to be. Um, I don't remember exactly how long it was like that until they figured out, oh no, that's actually on its hand. Weird. We're finding this down on its hand so often that maybe that's right. where it belongs. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so Iguanodon is a very like large-bodied dinosaur. Um, usually walks on four legs, but pretty often walks on two as well, which they didn't really show in the movie. They showed that for another uh, closely related dinosaur, but not really at all for Iguanodon. Yeah, I don't remember. That was that was the, like, Aladar was an Iguanodon, right? Yes. Yeah, that, yep. like, not long did they not show that, it didn't even, like... Look like they could. Yeah, right. It looked like they were a pretty, you know... In in most of the things that I've seen of this movie, it many people thought the Iguanodons were very comparable to horses. That's not, like, the worst comparison based on what I saw in the movie. Right. I, Especially right. in the face. Because, so Iguanodon yeah. normally has yeah. a beak. Oh, really? I, I don't know for sure if we knew that mm-hmm. at the time. i right. tempted to say we actually did. But you can't, it's much harder to make something emote and speak properly. Right. With a beak. With a beak. Yeah. Um, Call it artistic freedom. Right. But they very much had a horse-like muzzle. Especially the yep. NPC ones. Yep. <laughs> yes. Um, so we will come back to, to Iguanodon in a bit. The next big one is uh, Carnotaurus, the big uh, carnivorous one that chases them the whole time. I had a question about this one. Go ahead. What? Why? Why did they pick that one specifically? Instead or, of the obvious one for a movie T-Rex? made for kids. It, that, I'm like, because I went and Googled, I'm like, did they just like make up a dinosaur for them? Like, That's what a lot of people thought. And I Googled, I was like, there's a Wikipedia page for this, so okay. Carnotaurus is a real dinosaur. It is an incredibly well-studied dinosaur despite the fact that we only have one specimen of it, but the specimen is, like, incredible. So we only have one of them. Um, that, so for me, as a layperson, that gives me pause. Like, only one? Like, are we sure that, like, this wasn't just a T-Rex with a birth defect? Are we sure this, like... We are, we are very sure, for reasons that I will go into a little bit later. All right, all right. Continue, then. So Carnotaurus is sort of a medium to large size theropod. It is notably smaller than T-Rex, which is, isn't saying much because T-Rex is very big. Yeah. But uh, it is much smaller than they show it in the movie. Um, <laughs> and, and which, like, it's for dramatic effect. Yeah. Like, whatever. It's a, it's a predator. Right. It is a generally pretty lightly built. It's, it's rather tall, but lightly built uh, for how large it is. Okay. Which they don't do a good job of really showing in the movie. In the no. movie, they make it quite bulky. But the thing that Carnotaurus is known for, so T-Rex has a really long extended skull. Yes. Carnotaurus does not. It is very like bulldog-esque where its face is kind of smushed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, so Carnotaurus means flesh-eating bull. Flesh-eating bull? Because it has two horns right. on the top of its head. Okay. Sometimes you scientists know what you're doing. Yep. Um, and it has the tiniest little arms you've ever seen. Uh, like, you think T-Rex has tiny arms? Oh, no. Uh, so T-Rex's arms were basically about the size of your own arms, mm-hmm. more or less. But granted, it's, it's not a huge, right, gigantic animal. Right, not in proportion to... Uh, Carnotaurus arms were probably the length of, like, your forearm. Absolutely tiny. Given a few million years more of evolution, it probably would have just lost them. And how 
how big were Carnotaurus, like, just in general? Uh, we'll get into that a little more in a little bit, but okay. in okay. general, uh, like, 10 to 12 feet tall, typically. Okay. And um, we'll get more into the weight stuff uh, in a little bit. So, next we have Brachiosaurus, which is, uh, we talked about a bit uh, in the Sauropods episode. It is, basically, if you've seen Jurassic Park, I assume most people have, the first dinosaur you see, the big, long neck one that, like, rears up on its back legs. Yep. Uh, and the one that sneezes on Lex when they're sleeping in the tree. Those are Brachiosaurus. And that is Baleen, which I think is a hilarious name for it. Because Baleen, it's not spelled the same. Uh, but Baleen is the name of the, like, tooth filter stuff that the largest whales have in their oh. mouth instead of teeth. Yeah. Oh. They're, they're called Baleen whales. Okay. So it's basically just really weird. Uh, I believe it's modified from teeth, but I haven't done the research for the whale episode yet. So don't quote me on that. Uh, <laughs> we'll get there. Coming soon. Yeah, but uh, I just I thought that was hilarious that that was your name because a, a trait associated with whales is the name of a large sauropod. Think, is that on purpose? Or? Oh, that was absolutely on purpose. Okay. Um, but yeah, so very large dinosaur. Uh, unusual for sauropods in that the front legs were longer than the back legs. Usually the back legs were longer than the front legs. Okay. Uh, and it also held its, heck, held, held its neck pretty... Close to vertical, as close to vertical as most sauropods would get. Right. Um, but overall, Brachiosaurus, very well-known dinosaur. Next, we have Styracosaurus, which there were several of in the herd, including Ema. So Styracosaurus, like Triceratops, like like from behind the head, basically the same as Triceratops, maybe a little bit smaller, but not much. But from the head forward, um, so Triceratops, you know, has the two big horns above its eyebrows. Mm-hmm. And then the one horn on its nose. Styracosaurus has a bunch of, it has no eyebrow horns. And it has a bunch of large spikes on like the edge of its frill, sort of behind its head. Mm-hmm. But the big thing about Styracosaurus is that instead of having a little tiny nose horn, it has one real long nose horn. And for Ema to show that she was super old, it was broken. <laughs> it was broken off like very close to like the, the actual nose. So she didn't have this really large horn. Was she the only one in the film? There were a couple NPC ones in the herd. Okay. Uh, but for, for the Brachiosaurus, for Baleen, uh, they say pretty much as soon as you meet her that she is the last one, which I'll talk about later. <laughs> um, We've got a lot of we'll talk about that later. Yes, we so do. Far. There's so much to talk about with this movie. Next we have their pet, which uh, I'm so confused. It's yeah. like, are they or are they not anthropomorphized? So it's like, okay, you're turning all of the other dinosaurs into seemingly sentient creatures, and then you have this little guy that's just tagging along, who it's, literally even, like, pants like a dog, rolls over on his belly like a dog. I, I sort of, like, blocked some of that out and just, like, decided I wasn't going to figure that out. But, like, it was... <laughs> yeah, that was a that was an odd one. That, again, movie made for kids, mm. I guess. So, uh, Earl was a uh, genus of dinosaur called Euoplocephalus. I don't know exactly what that means. Something cephalus means something to do with the head. That sounds like an insult. Like you will pull cephalus. <laughs> <like it's> like... <laughs> um, but like I said, it's uh, an ankylosaurid, like armored dinosaur with a club tail. Uh, he was relatively small, so maybe he might have just been a young one. But uh, they're normally uh, at like the tallest part of their back, uh, like five and a half, six feet tall. Okay. Um, he was a little more spiky on his armor than most of them probably were. Uh, but there's not really too much to say about him, so we're moving on. Mm-hmm. And we have quite a few more to go. All the rest of these are NPCs. We hear none of the rest of these talk in the movie. Uh, so we have Parasaurolophus, very well-known dinosaur. This one is one of the actual duck-billed dinosaurs. So wait, with all these, like, how do we know? How do you know what they are? Like, is it just you're able to figure them out by watching it, or do the people who made the movie say, "Oh yeah, here are the other dinosaurs"? A bit of both. Okay. Um. So like for Parasaurolophus, for yeah. example, it's the only one that looks like it. Right. Um, so, cause the defining thing for Parasaurolophus is it has this big tube mm-hmm. that comes off the back of its head, like a, oh. a, a, a crest basically that we're not quite sure what it was used for. It was probably some kind of resonating chamber. As we've mm-hmm. talked about dinosaurs, we're pretty sure we're pretty noisy animals right. just because birds are very noisy. Crocodilians are very noisy with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so this probably helped amplify sound and helped it talk, you know, talk, right. quote, quote, air quotes that you can't see, um, <laughs> to its other members of its species more. Um, so this one was the one that was shown much more walking on its back legs only when it was just kind of walking. But if it was running, then it would go to all fours. Mm-hmm. 
which is probably more like what Iguanodon should have done, but whatever. Right. We have Struthio Mimus, who is, um, if you've seen Jurassic Park, again, very similar to the Gallimimus in that movie. Basically big ostriches without feathers, even though they probably should have had feathers. Um, Do we know that at the time this movie was made, the whole thing with dinosaurs' feathers? Probably, yeah. Okay. Um, that's an, another big thing. Not that I'm going to talk about it a lot, but most of... Not most. A lot of these should have had feathers. Okay. Um, but yeah, Struthiomimus, basically Gallimimus reskinned, maybe a little smaller. Uh-huh. Uh, we have Oviraptor, who is one of the dinosaurs who first tries to steal Aladar's egg at the very beginning sort of <laughs> Scooby-Doo sequence. By the way, when you say Aladar's egg, not like, you know, the, the, egg the one that contained Right, like him. the one that contained Aladar. Yes. So that is the one that picks him up after his herd gets attacked, fails to eat him, uh, and then kicks off the Scooby-Doo sequence of Aladar being lost as an egg. So Oviraptor is really interesting and it's very funny because its name means egg thief. <laughs> okay, uh, you know what? However, Get the credit for it's, that it's called that because... We found it, I think the first specimen found was found over top of uh, a nest of eggs. And it was assumed that it was trying to eat them. Okay. However, we're pretty sure that it was its own eggs. And that it was just protecting its eggs from something when it died. So it was not trying to eat them, it was just being a good parent. And the eggs were able to fossilize in that case? I believe so. Wow, okay. We um, talked before about how eggs don't fossilize all that well. Some eggs. Okay. In, so in, some in the last episode. So dinosaur eggs preserve quite well because oh, I they, because they're basically very similar to bird eggs and that they're hard shelled. Oh, okay. Whereas things like lizard eggs have a much more soft leathery shell. Gotcha, so gotcha. those don't preserve very well at all. Understood. Uh, we have another dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus, another ceratopsian. Similar, fewer horns this time. They said they had this big like pad of, like, rough skin sort of on their schnoz. Mm -hmm. um, they've sort of been reconstructed, potentially with a really large horn coming off of that, similar to rhinos, because rhino horns don't actually have any bone in them. That's all uh, keratin, like hair and, and nail material. So it's been sort of reconstructed with a horn similar to that coming off its nose, but there's not really any evidence for that, I don't think. Okay. We have the obligatory velociraptor. Yep, need those. Need those as your villain. Right. Um, they only show up sort of at the beginning of the movie, though. But they are a... Everyone knows Velociraptor. But these ones were not feathered and uh, were much too large. So with that, Velociraptor, moving on. We have Siggy Moloch, who, if you have seen uh, the most recent Jurassic World movie, uh, that's the one that Chris Pratt uses to break out of prison. Sure, it's... Uh... Spoiler alert for the most recent Jurassic World movie. <laughs> it, uh... It's sort of one of one of the traditional like headbutt dinosaurs. Uh, this one had a lot more spikes sort of around the back of its skull, though. Yep. Relatively small. And then we have a couple that are only worth mentioning because they're technically in the movie. Microceratus, very small ceratopsian dinosaur, only like chickenish size. You kind of just see it scampering around throughout the herd. Mm -hmm. We have so that's it for dinosaurs. Well, those are not the only animals. No, they're not. We have one pterosaur <clears throat> called Geosternbergia. That also picks up Aladar's egg, trying to eat it at some point during the Scooby-Doo sequence. Geo Sternbergia? Yes. I love these names. And funnily enough, this is probably the best depiction of a pterosaur I've seen in any movie. Because in any other movie, they would have had the pterosaur pick up the egg with its feet, which as we talked about, they cannot do. <laughs> yes, right. But in this one, it picks it up with its beak, like a proper pterosaur. <laughs> so kudos to you, Dinosaur 2000 movie. <laughs> Woo! Uh, we have a really, a, an animal that I really love, but is not talked about enough, called Kulasuchus. It is a big, most people would see it and be like, that's a gigantic salamander. Um, <laughs> this also eats Aladar's egg and then spits him back up in the Scooby-Doo sequence. Um, but it's not actually a salamander. It is a group, uh, a member of a group called Temnospondyls, which were the first amphibians to ever come on land. Way back. Are well, you sure about this? Yes. Wow. However, it is the last member of this group that we have before they go extinct. So this is the last one, and it made it almost to the end of the Cretaceous period. So it was around for, at least it was the, the last member of this group, I don't know, uh, almost 300 million years after they first arrive, or mm -hmm. first show up. So uh, they had a pretty good run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And then we have uh, a bird, which is really cool, called Ichthyornis. Pretty early bird. It still had teeth. Not really much else to say about it. Moving on. We'll get to the teeth. And then finally, lemurs. We yes. have some lemurs, uh, which are exactly what you're thinking of. They're lemurs. So those are all of the animals that I was able to figure out in the movie. Actually, mm -hmm. one exception that I actually forgot. One lizard. An actual lizard. Where was the lizard? At the In the very, very beginning. Okay. Before Aladar's herd even gets attacked by the Carnotaurus at the very beginning, before the Scooby-Doo sequence, <laughs> there's a young Parasaurolophus okay. that is chasing a lizard that is like sort of flying about. Uh, and then it basically leaves this Parasaurolophus to the Carnotaurus that then attacks the herd. That is a type of lizard called Langesquama. We're pretty sure it couldn't actually fly or even like sort of glide, kind of like it does in the movie. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure we knew that at the time, but I don't know that for sure. Um, anyway, forgot about that one, but that's in there too. So that was, those are all the animals in the movie. <laughs> yes, I took 15 minutes to talk about them, but Worth cool. It. Worth it. So with the animals out of the way, do you have where would you like to go with that? Uh, so real quick, let's talk about the animation. Okay. So, because I, as I was watching this, I pulled up the Wikipedia article okay. for, for this, and I saw that this won some awards. It did. For animation in the year 2000. And I think that that makes a lot of sense for the year 2000. Yes. I, and here's, here's what I'll say about the animation, is that it was, some of it was, like, amazing. Like, the, I still think, like, the way most of the dinosaurs were moving and stuff, mm -hmm. I thought that looked really, really cool. I agree. I thought there was some other, and there like the the way they had some water falling and everything. Um, so I will tell you, yeah, most of this movie is actually shot in the real world. I I'm gonna get there in a second. Okay, okay, okay then go ahead. Well, no, so I was gonna say, so there was there was uh, some stuff that was really good, and then there was some stuff, particularly in the um, the asteroid scene. The asteroid comes and blows. Yeah, was that like, wasn't the best. I was like, I agree. Really? Like it looked like. They had like their animated scene, and they just looked like they took a shot of fire, and just like put the yes, fuck. I agree. I was like, "That's what on earth?" So there it was... sort of looked like uh, it reminded me a lot, and I think they even might have had the same sound effect of from the first Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh -huh. when the Ark is exploding and killing everybody. <laughs> yeah, there's just like a, a random shot of just a wall of fire with like a black background, not even the scene behind it, just a black background behind it. Just a wall of fire moving from uh, right to left across the screen. Uh-huh. I remember what you're talking about. With uh, some stereotypical like fire sound behind it. And I'm pretty sure they use the exact same sound effect. I, I would 100% believe it. Like if they would have just taken in like an editing software that clip from Raiders <laughs> yeah. and put it in that movie, I would not have known the difference. <laughs> it was... I think that scene in particular was kind of like the peak of, oh, wow, this is this is some 2000s animation. Yeah. And I want to be like, you know what? Whenever we're doing any of this, A, it's a kid's movie, right. so it doesn't matter all that much. And B, it was the year 2000. Right. Computers Which, which good. means that they probably did most of this animation in 98 or 99. Right, exactly. It, you know, it'd been, I actually, I think I looked it up, like the genesis for this movie was like in the 80s. Yeah. And it took a while yeah. to, it to get in development. So. I don't like. I don't want to. I don't want to come down too hard on it. I think it was, <laughs> like, clearly it won award. Like it was good for its time. Right. Some of it still holds up, but some of it is janky. And there's also some in there that's a little. It, they put some weird slow mo shots in it for no reason. I, I was. I was going to get there too, but like the, the, there are some slow mo shots in there. And normally, like when you do slow mo, if you're like a big fancy movie company, especially animation. You can slow it down, but have the proper number of frames yeah. to show everything done. Where they didn't for this. This would be like if you took like your iPhone 3GS and recorded <laughs> and recorded some video, and then slowed it down afterwards. And it's just like, oh, okay, we're going frame by frame here. This is this is how we're doing this. I I think what made it look real weird is I don't think that so because like I said, almost all this movie is shot in the real world and then had the animations inserted into it, like of the dinosaurs and stuff. Which I did not know, and that makes ba it basically cool. like Pokemon Go, if you've played that. Well, it doesn't the, like the Polar Express do something similar. Oh, I have not heard that, but that'd be cool. I didn't I mean, know that. Hold on, I'm gonna do some. Sure. I do this all the time while we're recording. As I'm yeah. googling, I'm just like, <laughs> I want to know more about this. So, but you, you, you what, do what I think makes the slow mo scenes look weird is it seems like there's like a frame rate difference between the animation and the film of that, the background. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like they like they slow. Oh, the, in the background, it seems like they oh. have two different. Like they're the frames are out of sync or something. That's I was what too it seems focused like on the me. foreground. That's that's what it seems like to me. 
Like, they slowed uh-huh. them down different amounts. Oh, my God. Yes. So, I don't know if that's just a weird editing error or if it was somehow intentional and just didn't look the way they wanted. Or there was some kind of, like, time crunch where it was like, we got to get this movie out. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I don't know. But I definitely... Those were... I, in my opinion, the slow-mo scenes were the weakest points of the movie. Slow-mo scenes were definitely um, incredibly weak. There, there was some innovation that was really good. There was some that was really janky. And I thought there was some, and this is where I think we get to the teeth, that was really Uncanny Valley. That was... Close enough. Do you know what Uncanny Valley is? No, I do not. So the Uncanny Valley is like if you've got, you know, you, you know, you've got humans that look human. Okay. And let's say you've got, you know, just like a children's doll that like, you know, is supposed to resemble a human, but it's just really not all that close. And okay. it looks like a doll. But then if you start, so on that continuum of a literal human and a doll, if you start taking that doll and working on it and working on it and working on it, you'll get to be really, really close to human, but not white okay and it's kind of at that point where something's close to human or close to the real world but just not quite and it just kind of looks creepy okay um you know if you see you know and there's some you know i think the polar express actually might be <laughs> a, uh, a decent example I, where, okay that's a good comparison because i definitely agree where it's like they look like people but not like normal people right and there was i think some in this movie where it was like this is so close, and it's it really is like well done from a technical point of view. Yeah. But just watching it as an experience, it's like there's something off about this. Yeah. And this is where we get to, I think, the teeth. Yeah. So, like I said, the iguanodons, who again are do most of the talking in the movie, they should have beaks but don't, and instead of beaks, <laughs> they give them more or less human teeth, but with no. Basically, just like a single curved human tooth, right? Yeah, no, on each of their jaws. No, it, it, you had a word for it. What's the word for like different kinds of teeth? Heterodont. Hetero. Yeah, there was it. None of that. It was just it was you know a single bar. A, bottom row. a yeah. single bar of teeth on each jaw. Yep. And it and they made them almost the same texture as the skin or like the nails. Yes. Where it yes. was like sort of rough and cracked. I'm like, why would your teeth be like? That? Right. It was. It, it was it was the it was weird. That was by far the weirdest yes. sort of dinosaur choice that they made for like the, the, the like models or renders of the dinosaurs. Right. Um. Yeah. And I'm like, I I couldn't stop looking at it. It it was very distracting to me. It was it was so incredible, and it's one of those things where you know we didn't see the rough draft of the movie where they had <laughs> where they had regular teeth and yeah. they were and it just like didn't work. So again, I don't want to you know they, they, they made a better movie than I can make. They made it work with Baleen, though. Which one was Baleen? The, the, uh... the sauropod. Okay. So Baleen had individual teeth, but her yes. face was a lot more, like, fleshy. Yes. So maybe that was part of it, where you didn't really see her upper teeth much. Uh-huh. Um, or maybe that was their attempt at being like, hey, we kind of gave it a beat. <laughs> Give it a shot. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was It was just very odd. It's, it's kind of like when... Um... And I, I never saw this movie, and this isn't really my demographic. But do you remember when um, there was that whole big kerfuffle when uh, the Sonic the Hedgehog movie was? I did not see it either, but I, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Right. For those that aren't familiar, like the Sonic the Hedgehog, they made a it movie was about it. Right. And like when they first released the trailer, <laughs> like the Sonic the Hedgehog was just, it was like, oh my, like, guys, I'm sorry, but try again. And I believe to their credit, they did. The and studio, they... in between the time that trailer was released and the movie came out, like they didn't push back the release date, I don't think. They went and redid the whole Sonic the Hedgehog, and it actually looked, I believe, good. Yeah. Um, I don't know how the movie was. Never saw it. Not my demographic. But Right. They they basically gave Sonic human teeth. Yes. And weird human eyes, and a much sort of, like, more smushed human-like face. Right. And it was real weird. Um, yeah. But it, I, I definitely feel it. Yeah, it was, like, the same sort of energy. Exactly. Yes. A hundred percent. So I think that was so like I think that was most of my nitpicking with okay uh, with like the animation and uh, and the other kind of stuff. So mm. do you have like things I have on... a lot more nitpicks. Okay, so like hit me with the nitpicks and we'll see because this are, might jog my memory. These are mostly sort of like science based nitpicks instead of you know like movie critiques. I'm like okay, this this is why I was watching this movie because right, right. I've seen it like ten times in the last couple weeks with my niece because it's all she's watched. <laughs> okay. But, so this time I sat down and watched it, like, for the, the science critiques, so. I, I was assuming as I was watching this, I will just really quick, yeah. and then you can tell me how right or wrong I am. But as I was watching this, the whole time I was just thinking, no freaking way. No, like, this not, none of it, 
none of it works. It's not scientifically accurate. They're making crap up the whole time. And then I get here and we're getting ready to record the podcast. And Gavin comes here. He's like, yeah, got a whole list of things they did right here. They did a lot of things scientifically. So, so I'm like, oh, come on. The dinosaurs, sons, iguanodon face and featherless dinosaurs that should have feathers. Most of the dinosaurs were actually pretty good. Um, when you say most, like you mean like the way accurate. they were represented? Yes, they were, okay. they were pretty accurate. Um, with some exceptions that I'll talk about. But for the most part, all of them look pretty much the way they should. They didn't really yeah. fall into too many of like the very common traps that a lot of other right. dinosaur movies do. Mm -hmm. um, they were within an acceptable range. Yeah. Okay. But where it really gets funky for me is when and where all the different kinds of dinosaurs actually lived. Mm -hmm. Because very few of them lived at the same place, let alone okay. the same time. Okay. So, most of this is coming from memory. I don't have most of this in my notes, but I know sort of the, the main characters of the movie. So, Iguanodon lived sort of in the late Jurassic, early Cretaceous. So, around 120 or so million years ago. Presumably... The big asteroid that hits at the beginning of the movie is the one that ends up killing the dinosaurs. That's the vibe I was getting, because it turns the world, except for the nesting grounds, into a giant hellscape. That that was, it was kind of one of those things where I'm almost certain that's what they were going for, and yet the vast majority of the movie takes place post asteroid, or so. Right, and like that's, it's not like the asteroid killed all the dinosaurs instantly. Right, exactly. But like they were close enough where, where yes, um, and like the asteroid. If an asteroid that big is coming from space, like there's a nice sort of not slow mo, just like it falling, mm -hmm. like as if you just dropped a rock from really high, <laughs> it would be moving like thousands and thousands and thousands of miles per hour. You would not, you would barely be able to see it as it was falling. Right. It was definitely, it was definitely a, you know, and not like the slow motion we talked about before that was going frame by frame. No, it was just a slow motion. It was, rock. it was just like, oh, that thing's, it's falling. just slowly it's drifting yes. down. Yeah. Um, but presumably to me, that means that we're at the end of the Cretaceous period. So Iguanodon should not be there. Okay. Iguanodon was extinct for, uh, a solid, at least like 50, maybe like 40 million years by that point. Mm -hmm. Um, Carnotaurus was actually around at the end of the Cretaceous. However, it lived in South America <laughs> and we'll talk about the geography specifically in a bit. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it lived in South America at the end of the Cretaceous. Brachiosaurus uh, lived in the latest part of the Jurassic period. So it might have overlapped with Iguanodon for a little bit. Okay. But I don't believe that they're found together. I don't think they occur at the same place at the same time. So the, the timing is possible, but the geography is not. Right. Okay. Uh, and I think that's kind of, they kind of get away from that being mm -hmm. a real critique with them being like, Baleen is the last Brachiosaurus. So it's like... I guess it's kind of possible that some Brachiosaurus... Actually, no. It would definitely would have been morphologically different and not be a Brachiosaurus by that point. Mm -hmm. But it's like suspending disbelief. Sure. Fine. Well, they gave they gave a canon excuse in the movie for that. Okay. Uh, I'll forgive that. Um, Styracosaurus and... Uh, let's see. A lot of them are actually from North America. So most most of them, you know, like Styracosaurus, Europlocephalus, Parasaurolophus, Struthiomimus... Pachyrhinosaurus, Stegomolac, most of them are from the Cretaceous of North America, but there are some that are definitely not. Velociraptor is from the Cretaceous of Asia, which was not connected to North America by this point. We do not have any uh, Velociraptor fossils from North America at all. <laughs> you could argue that it's some other closely related uh, dromaeosaur dinosaur, uh, which there were quite a few of in North America at the time, but like, come on. It's, it's, yeah, it's a Velociraptor. Um, Oviraptor, which there is not another one that really looks similar to Oviraptor, also lived late-ish Cretaceous in Asia. Mm -hmm. So there's not any other dinosaur that looks like Oviraptor. So that's just plain in the wrong spot if this is supposed <laughs> to be North America. Um, Kulasukas, the big salamander guy, lives in Aus was was from Australia. <laughs> Complete other side of the planet at so, this point. So it seems as though geography just like was not it went out the window. Was not taken into into account for this. It was, we're no. gonna find the coolest dinosaurs and also or the ones that work for our movie. Right. And also, but here's the thing. They could have had there were many duck billed dinosaurs around at the end of the Cretaceous. 
they could have chosen Edmontosaurus, which is frankly a little larger, mm -hmm. actually quite a bit larger than Iguanodon. And very few people would have known the difference. So they it wouldn't have changed the movie in basically any noticeable way. Nope. So they could have just, they could have done this correctly. Yes. Had they wanted to. Um, but the geography continues to get weird because A, lemurs, well, number one, lemurs were definitely not around in the Cretaceous. Primates weren't even around in the Cretaceous period. Mm -hmm. Lemurs show up sometime like the, the late Paleocene, early Eocene, so like 50 or so million years ago. Um, and they're only found throughout all of their fossil history in Madagascar. That really? Is, that is that yes, specifically? Yes. The island of Madagascar. Was Madagascar an island at that point? Yes. Okay. Or like in, in the Cretaceous, you mean? Yeah. Whenever, whenever they were around. Lemurs. Yes. Um, dur during the time of the movie, the Laish Cretaceous, it was, it was an island. It was connected to India, I, I believe at the time. Okay. Um, so, so if the island that they're supposed to be on is Madagascar, number one, we have dinosaur fossils from Madagascar. So there would have been dinosaurs on that island. The whole beginning part of the movie doesn't make sense because Aladar is supposed to be the only dinosaur on the island. <laughs> number two. The asteroid that uh, ended the Cretaceous period hit in the Gulf of Mexico. Notably, like the, the Yucan, right, or whatever. The Yucatan. Yucatan, yeah. Notably, not where Madagascar is. Eh. You might know that is <laughs> the other hemisphere. Yeah, and so today those two locations are approximately nine thousand miles away. It was probably about the same, if not a little more, just because Madagascar was much more south and the Yucatan Peninsula was much more north. Although east west they were closer together, so it was probably about the same total distance, just spread out differently. Mm -hmm. Still, easily at least like five thousand miles away. So the sky would have probably been real red because that would really cause a huge fireball in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But you would not be able to see the actual rock, <laughs> nor would it even have caused that big tsunami and firestorm if it hit where it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm not just saying that these are lemurs, like, inferring. It, several times in the movie, they call them lemurs. Right. So these are for sure lemurs. Uh, or at least it's supposed to be. And like I said, Carnotaurus lived in South America. And we only have the one specimen. So as far as we know, it's the only place that it lived. It is the only dinosaur, only animal in the movie that is from South America. Uh, I think they chose it because... Uh, I, I remember seeing some stuff quoted from this director being like, he wanted to highlight some lesser known dinosaurs, which okay. is why he did it. And chose that's a noble goal. Yeah, and chose not to put like Triceratops in. Mm -hmm. Instead, he picked some other closely related but very differently looking, like Styracosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus. Um, he did again still throw in Velociraptor as one does. I think but, it's a requirement. Yeah, it's in the Constitution or like. But, but that is something. why yeah. they chose not to do T Rex. Okay, and if that if that actually is not only does that make sense, I think it's actually a good reason. I, I agree. I am pro that making that choice if that's what they were trying. Carnotaurus is a really cool, uh, really unique dinosaur. Mm -hmm. it, ha it does have some close relatives, but they're that's not really, unique. really yeah, similar. Because there's only one. So can we get to how we're sure this was an actual thing and not just some it, bastard it is, child? Of... It is so different. Okay, compared to its relatives, I think so, it, the its relatives don't have anything even close to, like, the two horns on the top of its head. Right. Some of them might... I think it's loosely related to a dinosaur called Ceratosaurus, which has a single horn on its nose. Okay. So they... It is related to other dinosaurs with horns in the face area. <laughs> but none of the other ones have, especially, like, the two split coming off to each side horns, mm -hmm. uh, like Carnotaurus has. So one thing... And it's... This is a real critique of, like, people who talk about Carnotaurus. Not anything to do with the movie. But people sort of speculate that this might have been for, uh, like, fighting, like, males fighting males. And I'm like, this one could be a female, for all we know. We only have one. <laughs> we, only... we only have one. <laughs> so we have no idea what it was using these for. So, like, if you can speculate, but it's like, don't claim that that's true, because now, we don't know. Now, for most dinosaurs where we've got, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is most, but for dinosaurs where we have a bunch of different, you know, fossils, a bunch of different specimens, can we tell which is male and which is female? Or can we infer which is male and which is female? Very rarely. Okay. Um, occasionally, there's some morphology in the hips. Right. Um, sometimes you can tell... Like, I believe we know for sure that Sue the T-Rex was a female. Uh-huh. I'm trying to think of how we know that, though. 
Off the top of my head, I don't know. With some species, you can, and some you can't. I was going to add, because like, it makes total sense. There's only one species, and there's nothing to compare it to, and you know, yeah. none of the parts are important. You mm-hmm. can, like makes sense. But I was wondering, you know, can you compare you know, you know, specimens against specimens and see if there's a difference? So only some. Yeah, and it's like, it's, it, that's really hard to as well, because if you look at, even though we're both dudes, if you looked at our skeletons, there would be certain differences. Yes. Um, mammals are a little different because, uh, you know, females have to squeeze babies through their pelvis. So that changes the shape of their pelvis. So with mammals, it's actually quite easy. Okay. Uh, but eggs are easier to squeeze out, apparently, than uh, than entire babies. So we'll go with that. Yeah. So the rest I have is just sort of some commentary on how they depicted some of the dinosaurs. What I right. said was, was largely good. Was it really? Uh, yeah, again, wow, okay. so, the, so the iguanodons, other than just being weirdly horse-like, I'd say behind the head, basically fine. Good to go, okay. Um, like I said, Velociraptor and Oviraptor should have had feathers, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I think I talked about in the Jurassic Park episode, but I don't remember, is so dinosaurs could not, what's called pronate or supinate their wrists. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes you will see dinosaurs, mostly Velociraptor and relatives, depicted with their hands sort of facing with their palms facing down. If they're mm-hmm. holding their hands in front of them, they mm-hmm. could not do that. Mm-hmm. So they could only hold their hands with the palms facing each other inward. Okay. So the way I, it's often phrased is dinosaurs are clappers, you know, right. Instead of slappers. That makes, so they could clap their hands together, but they could not like slap their knees. For those of you at home, Gavin is currently clapping his hands. He like, they could clap their hands like that, but they could not slap their knees. Like you're a dad and your kid just told a great joke. Yes. Like, so, uh, they only fall for this once that I see, and it was a weird shot where it's like, I can't tell mm-hmm. if the Velociraptors actually had their hands in the wrong position, or if uh, it was just the way the camera was sort of angled on them. Mm-hmm. Um, but, thought it was worth mentioning because I, literally every movie with dinosaurs that I've ever seen has gotten that wrong. Right. Um... In my notes, I literally have pterosaur didn't pick up egg with its feet. A plus plus plus. <laughs> Good, right, hey. Carnotaurus was much larger, as I sort of mentioned earlier, than it should have been. Okay. So it sort of gave me like T Rex vibes. Yes. And I, and I was just like, why didn't? And that was where I was like, why not just you know make it the T Rex? But okay, right. so they went with the lesser known dinosaur. Made but, but it just bigger. Made it larger. Right. Did it have? This is a question you might not be able to answer. Do we know if it behaved like this kind of apex predator? Like it was I mean, they, in the movie? they make it very monstery, like yes. the bad dinosaur, like the bad dinosaurs in every dinosaur movie, right? In that it attacks anything that moves, doesn't speak, doesn't doesn't speak, just screams all the time, even when it's hunting and trying to be, mm-hmm. you know, you don't see lions screaming at the top of their lungs when they're hunting a zebra, mm-hmm. like they're trying to breathe because they're chasing it, you know. Mm-hmm. I feel like screaming while you're running after something that is supposed to be as big or slightly bigger than you <laughs> trying to eat it, you'd probably want your energy. Yeah. Not the, not the best um, uh, way to use resources. Right. So they do make it very monstery. Um, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. That That's every movie. So I'm not going to nitpick this particular, I'm not going to dock this particular movie for doing it. Right. I would give them extra bonus points if they hadn't done it. Fair. But so, just for, for reference, so Carnotaurus uh, normally is somewhere between, estimated between sort of its bottom range being around 2,900 pounds, which is actually not that much for a 10 to 12 foot yeah. tall dinosaur. I mean, that, you know, that's that, but that's the lower end. It's, you know, literally just about a ton and a half. But yes, yeah, that's, that's, that's the lower end. Right. The upper end is around 4,600 pounds. But again, so, because we only have the one specimen, it's really hard to tell. The answer is probably, as per usual, somewhere in the middle. We'll say somewhere around... Uh, two tons? Yeah, maybe a little less than two tons. Okay. But again, around 10 to 12 feet tall. Iguanodon, on the other hand, the average that I was able to find was around 6,800 pounds. So three and a half tons. Some of them are estimated to be much larger. So potentially, uh, you know... A ton and a half more than Carnotaurus' sort of average and would be around the same height. So they would have looked each other in the eye. 
Okay. Which the Carnotaurus in the movie looked at least six, eight feet taller. Yes. It was definitely depicted as being larger. Something to be feared by the smaller right. uh, Iguanodon, right? Yes. Yeah. So, and granted, Aladar was also shown to be relatively young. Um, yeah. Because he lacked some of the, like, bigger, bumpier features of Crone and Bruton. The, the only, like, adult, mm-hmm. non-NPC <laughs> Iguanodon that we see. Yep. Um, so he hadn't yet developed. They had like a big bump sort of on their nose that uh, Aldar didn't really have. So he was relatively young. So granted, he might have been on the small side, but still, even Crone was much, much smaller than this thing. So if he's supposed to be the big, tough, bad guy, he would have been able to look this thing in the eye if, if it mm-hmm. was the size it was supposed to be. Right. So that's, that's most of... Oh, one last thing that I yeah. have in here. What's that? What we got? So it was around this time where we really see public opinion, because scientists had kind of known this, or at least highly speculated, that dinosaurs were warm-blooded mm-hmm. uh, by this point. But we see the public starting to actually come around and see that. And there was... It's literally just a throwaway line. But uh, when they're hiding in the cave... Uh, and, and Bruton comes in, Aladar says to him, do you want to sleep over here with us? It'll be warmer. Mm-hmm. That implies that they have warm bodies. Otherwise, why would it be warmer if they're all, you know, cold blooded and the same temperature as the, the cave? A little small thing, but kind of shows that so, like yeah, right. somebody, somebody in the writer's room might've been paying attention or might've, you know, knew what they were doing. Right. Similar to, and granted, this movie came out seven years after Jurassic Park, but... Uh, again, a complete throwaway thing, but in the scene in Jurassic Park, when the Velociraptor is sort of looking through the kitchen window and it right. breathes it out, it out and, it, and it fogs up, up the, yeah, 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 right. So I, I remember talking about that in the Jurassic Park episode. Uh, again, that just implies that if it's breathing out, you know, something that's going to fog up the glass, its breath is warmer than the glass. Therefore, implying warm blood, right. and you know, you know, so, very, you know, very slowly teaching the public, right, impossible. Yes, so. That was the last sort of thing that I kind of had in here. Um, so, I mean, if, that, if that's the last thing you had, I think we, yeah. can, we can end it here. R- rate this film. Was it, was this a good movie? Ooh. Was it a good movie when you were a kid? Yes. And, was it, and, is, <laughs> and is it a good movie? Because I, I agree. If a kid was going to watch this, they would pro- they'd probably enjoy the hell out of it. Yeah. yeah because there's my, dinos- Can confirm, my niece loved it. <laughs> There's dinosaurs, and you know, there's there is some cool animation, and you know, kids don't notice bad stuff, and you know, there's a rather easy to follow storyline. Yeah. So like, I think it's I think you got a little kid going on. Perfect, perfect for a little kid. Is it actually a good movie though? Because kids notoriously like bad things. <laughs> like you know, you like you go to a kid, you bring a kid to a restaurant. What do they want? Ketchup. What's the, the worst condiment? Ketchup. Kids have bad opinions on things. The Lego Batman movie. Is incredibly highly rated, but I'm positive that it's a bad movie. <laughs> the Lego I've Bat- never seen it, but I am positive that it is a bad movie. <laughs> I have not seen the Lego Batman movie. I've seen the Lego movie. So, I would say, did I enjoy watching this movie? Yes, I did. Okay. So, what, does that mean that it's high, fine cinema? Right. No, not right. at all. <laughs> oh, no, there, there's, there's plenty of bad movies that I like. You put on Spy Kids 3D for me, and I, oh, I'm good. Excellent movie. I'm good. Well, no, no, no. Okay, but no, that no. is high it, cinema. It's a great bad movie. It is a mm. it's a very good bad movie. I disagree. That is just excellent cinema, regardless of context. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's the, the, I, <laughs> the first two. The first two, I will go to bat for all of them. The third one. Great bad movie, and I'm standing with that one. And we don't talk I would about say the fourth it is, one. It is the wor- it is the worst of the first three. Yes. Yes. The second one is by far the best. Yeah, I, I, I'm so happy you said that. I'm so happy you yes. said that. The second one is the best. Anybody not refer- knowing what we're talking about, go watch Spy Kids. Go watch Spy Kids. They were such good movies. I was, oh, yeah, me and everybody I knew, we were so into, like, we were the Spy Kids. We were going to be Spy Kids. Absolutely. It was uh, awesome. Excellent movies. I'm glad they somehow came up in this discussion about a dinosaur movie. <laughs> um, so what, what would you say? Would you say this is a good movie? Didn't enjoy it at all. No, really? I, I was watching it and it was it, it was one of those things where I was waiting. I was sort of waiting for the next thing to happen and waiting for it to be done. It was 
it is it was what I don't like about what are what I see as like common like cash grab movies for kids where it's that's a, fair. It is there's a really clear storyline. There's really well defined, just good guy bad guy. Yes. I can see like I can see where this is going, and it it was one of those things where there was just nothing interesting to me watching it. Now, like from the dinosaur point of view, if I knew more about these dinosaurs or like I was watching it with Gavin, I think that would be a lot better. Now, okay. if you have not watched this, you know, now knowing what you know, I think that that might actually make it a lot more interesting having that kind of knowledge. But from a, from a cinema uh, point of view, it wasn't, it, it just did nothing for me. I think that's fair. Cause like you, you said that you watched, or you remember at least it exists. I there I have a memory of watching it at one point. I may have entirely invented that, and my girlfriend <laughs> did the same. But I'm pretty sure that we I had watched that movie. I think we had it on DVD and watched it on like our like strap in like car yeah. DVD players to keep my younger brothers occupied on like trips to Hershey Park. Any young folks listening? This is the technology that we had to live through yeah. in the early two thousands. <laughs> Uh, I, I've looked at our analytics. We don't have any young people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so maybe it's just because I have a little bit of that nostalgia blindness. Okay. You know? Uh, you actually remember watching this movie instead yes, of it like triggering a memory. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, I even remember, I think it was Burger King. Burger King always gave out the best toys yep. uh, from movies and, and other media franchises. When I was mm-hmm. They had uh, like puppets. Of Aladar and Nira. Did they? They did. And they were... I, I googled one recently, and they look horrifying. <laughs> they are so bad. But I remember both my sister and I having them, and us playing with them for so much. They're, of course, <laughs> lost to time. Of course. Somewhere. We, I'm sure we broke them, or our parents just got sick of them. Threw them away. Yep. Um, but, yeah. Oh, God. I mean, a movie like this, especially for, like, you know, for Disney... You make a movie like this for kids, and then you've got all the merchandise. Like you just sell, you know, there's dinosaurs. People will buy dinosaur stuff for their Absolutely. kids. So it's it's a great kind of movie for Disney to make because you can make a bunch of money off of it. Yeah. So overall, if you're if you have kids around, show them the movie. I think they're gonna like it. Not personally my thing, but if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably in the demographic that would <laughs> get some kind of enjoyment out of um, a a formulaic kids movie, but still uh, still well done in some parts. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I just, I love this movie, but I, I'm, I'm positive that it is the, the nostalgia blindness. <laughs> so. We, we all have those movies. This has been episode 36 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. We begin a new era next week where we will be recording from coast to coast. Absolutely. We've done, we've done middle of the continent and a coast. Yes. But we are now going into... Transcontinental. Yeah, transcontinental. We'll be three time zones away. Yes. So we'll probably go back to recording when it's like 10 o'clock my time. And yeah. just the evening for me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, like we used to do in the good old North Dakota days. But thank you for listening. North they... Dakota. South Dakota. What the... Is there a difference? No, you're right. All right. The Dakota. It's South Dakota. I apologize. Over in Dakota. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Doesn't matter. All right. If we're doing if we're doing nostalgia trips, this is a real deep cut. Okay. And I might embarrass myself here. Did you ever watch The Fairly Odd Parents? Of course I did. Do you remember the time when like the principal comes over the loudspeaker in the Fairly Odd Parents and said that the two Dakotas have put aside their differences and decided to form together as one Dakota? I do not, but they should. <laughs> At one point, that has been a proposed solution for um like, I'm pretty sure you could campaign against like Puerto Rican statehood or DC statehood just on the basis of it would make 51 states and thus 51 stars. You could solve that by combining the Dakotas. Yeah. Although I remember, so there we're getting really deep into oh, this. Yeah, the, the episode's over. Yes. And so if you're only interested in dinosaur content, feel free. <laughs> but uh, there's an episode of last week tonight with John Oliver that I watch frequently uh, where talking about, I think DC statehood uh-huh. and they show the American flag several times throughout the show. And at the end of the show, he reveals that there were 51 stars on the flag the entire time. Oh, really? And I guarantee none of you noticed. (laughs) So. Oh, I completely agree. I'm just confident you can get a majority of Americans to vote and say, no, I don't want 51 stars on that flag. This is 50 United States. Interestingly, there is actually a percentage of people in the Dakotas that actually think it should not form a single Dakota, but change from north and south to east and west. Really? Yes. 
because the the geography and culture of Western North Dakota and Western South Dakota are very are more similar to each other huh. than they are to the eastern side of their respective state. That is, I actually, you know what? Let's do that. Why not? Why not? I forget who it was when the Dakotas became into the state. I think I forget who the president was. It might have been Wilson. It was uh, the 1880s. It was the 1880s? Oh, so it might have been Cleveland then. Uh, I'll have to double check this. But the cool thing uh, was, and I don't know if you know this, um, when it happened, but they, uh, the president at the time signed them into the union blindly. Like he closed his eyes and he shuffled <laughs> the papers. And he was like, they'll be twins. We'll never know which one came first. I signed them both. Oh, I love and we'll that. And we'll, we'll, we'll never know. And so they are uh, so they're funny. kind of the twin states. Nobody knows which exactly came first. That's so and also, by the way, this is just how me and Mike talk to each other all the time. It is. Anyway, we just talk about random history and science facts. This is literally our lives. It is, it is, a, it is such a good time, especially when our other friends are around. Yeah. And we can just continue to, to banty about. But... I think we will end this episode and stop subjecting you <laughs> to all of this, even though we are going to continue long after we are done recording. This has been episode 36 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. Thank you, Gavin, for coming on down. Thank you, everybody that listens and has made it this far into the episode. It really does uh, it really does mean a lot to know that uh, even though we don't have a very large listener base that you know anybody has chosen to uh, to listen to these episodes, it, uh, it really is kind of cool. Absolutely. See you guys next week.